Okay, now welcome to this particular SOP. Um, this one is with particular reference to the child protection procedure. Um, and as the SOP, um, sorry, as the, uh, um, the, 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 the name suggests, it's, it's actually a process that um, is required in order to, for you to help identify potentially children that, 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 that are vulnerable, who have potentially been abused, um, and and what action to take as a result of this as well. So let's quickly go over the background. Okay, now um, essentially this is a bit of blurb here. It basically says that pharmacists and pharmacy staff regularly come into contact with children, um, and basically that all healthcare professionals, including those that do not have a role specifically related to child protection, have a duty to safeguard. Um, and support the welfare of children, which is a, which is a very noble cause, really, and 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 I fully support this as well. Um, now, this is quite an interesting thought here. The the challenging nature of the pharmacy practice means that the profession is likely to have an increased role in child protection, and therefore, as a pharmacist or registered pharmacy technician, you can be involved with identifying concerns about a child and referring them on to the social services or the police if necessary. Uh, responding to a request from social services for information about a child or their family and finally providing a professional pharmaceutical service for a child or a family as part of an agreed child protection plan um, but at the same time what you also need to do is you need to be alert to the potential for indicators of abuse and neglect and be familiar with the local procedures for promoting these as well um, um, th 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 there are quite a few things here, so um, it's, it's, it's quite a lot to take in, but this is basically what the, the, the SOP is about. So the key principles, okay, as I said, when you go when you look at your SOP as well, this is what it will show. Um, the pharmacist and the pharmacy staff essentially need to be alert to the possibility of child abuse and neglect. They need to be able to recognise and act upon the indications that a child's welfare or safety might be at risk. Um, they may they need to be familiar with the local child protection procedures okay and they need to know where to find the contact details of the professionals in the locality and as a result of this um, one of the things that you'll find in your SOP is is that the pharmacist who you're working for um, or the superintendent will have written these down you can normally find these by contacting the local authority okay so you've got uh, private personnel the social services and um, uh, the, the 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 local child protection officer as well, the child protection officer. Okay, so if you as a pharmacist believe that a child is being neglected or abused, then these are things that you you're going to want to do. You're going to want to seek advice from local um, professional, so from a local professional with expertise in child protection. You're going to want to follow the local child protection procedures and report your concerns to the appropriate authority and you would want to keep records of the concerns of and of your concerns and the actions that you take the things you don't want to do is ignore it okay it's certainly it's certainly not going to be in the best interest of the child if you have hunch and and you and you, st and you still don't do anything about it um that you attempt to investigate your suspicions or allegations of abuse it's not your job to investigate it it's your job to report it um, and it's and, and don't necessarily discuss your concerns with the suspected or alleged perpetrator of the abuse. Okay, uh, now child abuse can occur in a variety of different circumstances and across all social groups. Children may be particularly vulnerable if there is a history of family violence or abuse, bullying, drug or alcohol abuse, mental health problems and so forth here, especially if you're coming from a, a, a low socioeconomic um, area as well, a poor socioeconomic area I should say. Um, an abused child may be subjected to one or more type of abuse and neglect. Where there is concern about a child's welfare, significant harm is a threshold for formal child protection inquiry. Decisions about whether significant harm has occurred or is likely to occur to require is, is it requires consideration by child protection experts of the degree of abuse, the effect on the child, and the circumstances surrounding the event or events. Okay. Um, now, child protection needs to help ensure that healthcare professionals who have concerns about the abuse and neglect adhere to child protection procedures and have access to necessary um, support and advice. NHS organisations are required. That's highlighted 
to have a doctor and a nurse with expertise in child protection. Okay, these professionals in the local authorities are a source of information about child protection and guidelines, training programs, and contact details of um, key personnel with expertise in children can be found from the local authority itself. Private hospitals should also have child protection procedures. Okay, as a healthcare professional, and this, and you know, if you're a farms technician, you are also a healthcare professional. Okay, so it's not just for the pharmacist. This is for you, um, for, for for members of staff, not just. Um, uh, uh, pharmacy technicians, but also for for healthcare assistants. If you, if you're working with the public, you're going to need to be aware and understand the risk factors and recognise children in need of support. You're going to need to recognise the needs of parents who may need extra help. Recognise the risk of abuse to an unborn child. Um, contribute to inquiries from other professionals about child uh, about a child in the family. Liaise closely with other agencies. Um, Play an active part through the child protection plan in safeguarding um, children from significant harm, and consider local protocols where they local start again local protocols where they exist, particularly with respect to sexual health and contraceptive studies. Now, this is when one thing, say for example, your EHC services might, and um, you might have to um, play a part in that as well. So, say for example, somebody under the age of 12 um, comes to you for um, uh, an EHC. Um, alarm bells should be ringing with that one. So the purpose really is um, to aim to give pharmacists and not just the pharmacist but also the the staff working under the pharmacist a process to do a process on what to do in the event that they suspect child abuse. So the scope of this particular SOP is um, what to do in the event of um, suspected child abuse. Okay, so the responsibility. <coughs> Now, in your SOP, you will have something like this. You will have um, the details of your child protection need, the contact details, including the direct de direct uh, sorry, direct telephone number, what to do in the event of emergency. Okay, so you should actually have these filled in already. If you don't have these filled in, ask your pharmacist to fill it in. You should be able to find the relevant information by contacting um, the NHS, uh, your local area team, um, or by contacting the local health authority or social services. Now the indicators of abuse okay it's really a simple cause and there are often an, a number of different signs and signals that you'll have to take into account now if say for example your healthcare assistant or if you are a pharmacy technician rather than taking on the range yourself and reporting it might want to actually mention this to the pharmacist before you do anything so if you do suspect something like this talk to the pharmacist first the indicators, I'm not going to go over each one, but you can read them here, unexplained or unusual injuries, um, blame, uh, injuries blamed on siblings, evidence of repeated injury, bite or scald marks, there's a whole number of different things here that, that, that you need to read up on, so please have a look at your SOP and just remember that. Uh, now, if it's an adult which is perpetrating the violence or, 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 or the abuse, there are a number of other things that you may want to take into account in addition to the indicators for the child. So for example, if the adult provides inconsistent explanations um, as to the child's injuries, delays seeking medical advice, shows detachment, uh, attributes the, the cause of injuries to a sibling or bullying, and so forth. So have a read of the indicators there as well. So what do you do if you suspect abuse? Um, first of all, you need to discuss your concerns with the named professional, and that's the reason why you have to have it in your SOP to begin with. Um, discussions with child's GP may also be helpful, and you could, without necessarily identifying the child in question, discuss your concerns with your peers or senior colleagues. At this point, it may be wise to contact the legal department of the PDA and the MPA for further advice and support. This is going to be a, a legal issue possibly in the future and you really want to be very, very acutely aware of that because you could end up in a lot of hot water if things go wrong and you don't follow your own process. If after discussion you still have concerns um, and consider the child that may be at need of risk, uh, maybe at risk or suffering significant harm, you should refer the child to the family s uh, and the family to the social services or an emergency to the police. Communicate with the child in a way that's appropriate to their age and their understanding. Children have a right to know what's happening and where appropriate should be consulted on the actions and decisions that affect them. 
Where concerns arise as a result of information given by a child, reassure the child that, but do not promise to maintain confidentiality. You're going to possibly need to give out that child's name to a number of different people um, in this protocol. So, you know, you can't promise a child in that, in that sense to maintain confidentiality. At the end of the day, you are um, taking over responsibility for that child's welfare until the social services do. When you make a referral to social services, clarify with them that the child and the parents or guardian will be, uh, what they will be told and by whom. Um, if your referral to social services is done then, uh, by telephone, confirm in writing within 48 hours. And finally, make a record of all the concerns and discussion of the child and the decisions you have taken and the reasons for this. This is um, essential that you do this because there's a very good chance it's going to come back and people are going to ask you why did you make that decision. Very important that you actually um, write that down. So, reporting sexual activity under uh, in, in, in children. Now, children under the age of 13 are considered in law to be too young to consent for, to, to sexual activity. Sexual activity with a child under 16, that is between 13 to 15 years, is also an offence. However, at this age it may be consensual and therefore be treated as a less serious offence. If it has been made clear that the law is not intended, so it has to be made clear that the law has not been intended to prosecute mutually agreed sexual activity between young people of a similar age unless it involves abuse or exploitation. There is a need to be vigilant for the signs of sexual abuse, especially in younger children, and prompt action must be taken if there is evidence or reason to believe that a child may be being sexually abused. While pharmacists and registered pharmacy technicians should be aware of and give appropriate consideration to local protocols for managing social, uh, sexual activity in children and young people, it is important not to deter children from seeking support and advice on sexual health matters and professional discretion should be used. So essentially what this is saying is that you need to be alert to this but at the same time not deter people from seeking advice. As you can see this stuff is quite uh, an emotional one as well you know you could affect quite a few people's lives in this it's really important you get this right. So what are the known risks? So basically the abuse goes unnoticed or unreported um, changes the child protection needs and unavailability of legal advice outside normal hours. Bearing in mind the fact this is very likely to be a legal case, very important that you actually record everything down. Now, what we've also included is a flow chart describing exactly everything that we've discussed so far. So, have a look at that, and uh, and essentially that is that is your protocol in place for for child protection.